Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, September 29, 2016, and this is the week in charts. So what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, your questions on trading, as usual, and your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, two things on the stock picks. One, wait until we get to the charts, or at least until I open it up for stock picks. And number two, just ask about one ticker symbol at a time. Put in the ticker symbol and then hit carriage return, and then you could put in as many as you want. But uh, that way I know which ones I've talked about and which ones I haven't. This week we're going to talk about staying with winners. And obviously there's some money management uh, that goes with that. But more importantly, there's a psychology that goes with that too. It's like I came in today saying, well, I haven't really spent a whole lot of time on money management lately, so I'm going to do that. But as you know, mind, money management, and methodology, they're all three intertwined and you can't separate them. So you start talking about one, you end up talking about the other. You talk about the other, you end up talking about yet the other one. So that'll all make sense in just one second. There's a disclaimer screen. You can get that off my website if you have nothing better to do. Uh, <laughs> one day I'm going to put a bunch of stuff in there, like uh, if you're having uh, – if you smoke after sex, you're doing it too fast and stuff like that, just to see if anybody ever actually reads them. Uh, they're all boilerplate, though. Basically, you can lose money trading. Or, as I like to sum it up, borrowing a line from my friend Greg Morris, all predictions about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Last week – I got asked about exiting on a signal versus a stop, and I want to continue with that conversation, and then that's going to lead us into the management of big winners and avoiding the micromanagement and the money management, and then, of course, the psychology of it all. So last week we covered this. This was a bow tie that set up a while back, way back in February, in fact, and we took partial profits for a swing trade. It took a little bit longer than a swing trade time frame, but we finally got our profits out of it. And then we began trailing a stop higher. That's where the stop was as of last week. It might still be there. I have to check the portfolio, which we'll look at in just one second. And I got to ask, should you exit on the bow tie sell signal? Well, if you look back on the chart, we did have – Nearly a bow tie sell. At first glance, as I said last week, I thought it was a sell signal back then, but it turns out that it wasn't. But then we did have another sell signal recently, and the point is, no, follow the plan and just exit on the stop. And then, not that this will always happen, and and admittedly, I hoped it would. Obviously, I always hoped it'd go up, but I hope that it went on to make new highs, so it'd make yet another great micromanagement example. And then two weeks ago, and then I think the week prior to that even, we had similar type of emails and similar type of uh, questions about whether or not they should get out of a trade because either A, it wasn't moving in their favor, or B, it just wasn't moving, period. It was, seems like it was dead money, and which, as you know, there's a reoccurring theme in here. So that's what happened there. So far, so good on that one. Now, as I said last week, there's nothing wrong with rules-based exits but you can't add them on the fly. So you can't be in a trade and say, okay, well, I got my stop in place. Oh, man, it looks like uh, I'm going to have to give up some open profits here. It looks like I'm going to get stopped out. Oh, I noticed there's this sell signal in place too, so I better get out. No, that's not how it works, Beatrice. That's not how any of this works. Anybody remember those commercials? So – what you want to do is, if that's going to be your rule to exit on a rule, then make that your rule. You can't add in new rules on the fly. Now, this is what I added in this week. A stop is much easier. It's much easier just to have that stop in place. And if you can take it out, you can take it out. And that requires a lot less thinking if you have that stop in place. You don't have to think, oh, it's got this signal or it's got that signal or it, it, it also reduces the collect, uh, complexity, so you're not saying, wait, is this a signal or not? You're not having to look for those signals. It's very simple. You just have a stop in place. And trust me, I tried everything over the years, and I just find it's much easier to exit on a stop. Now, if you think about it, a stop exit is likely going to be some signals anyway. So the ultimate goal would be to get out, let's say you're, you're in something, the ultimate goal will be to get out if the position fails, okay? So rather complicate things with some sort of signal to tell you when to sell, 
just let that stop so uh, take you out. Now that stop, the ultimate goal is to get out of a trade when the trend has ended, which is easier said than done, right? If to do it right. But what we do is we let that stop widen out, and I'm going to talk a lot about that in just a little while, until hopefully we can ride out these longer-term corrections. So that stop, when it does stop you out, obviously you're going to have some sort of sell signals triggering anyway. So just by exiting on a stop, it makes your life much easier. You don't have to think about it, okay? Now, as I said last week, keep in mind there's nearly always a reason to exit a position and rarely a reason to stay. The more observations you make, the more you're going to realize that, wait, this position is going against me. And keep in mind, as I often say, that all trades eventually get badly. But hopefully, and there's that word again, but it's not hope if you have a plan in place and if you're if you're trading the best and leaving the rest and all these other things I preach about. But hopefully, as your stop begins to widen out, you can ride out these longer term corrections. And then sooner or later, yes, you will give, give up some profits at the end. But if you're giving up profits up here and you make, let's say, 200 percent of the trade, OK, even though you gave up. From here to here, you were up, let's say you were up 200, and, I don't know, 40% up here, okay? Even though you gave up some in the end, so what? You have to look at 200% from here to where you got in. 200% is 200%, okay? And as I said, also said last week, and you're going to see where I'm going to dovetail in on all this, fear is a much bigger motivator than reward. As I said recently, uh, I I think it was last summer I started working on a trading psychology course and I got 14 pages of just a to-do list of things I wanted to cover. And I was looking at some of these behavioral science books and they all start to look the same after a while. And that's why I, I have so much trouble uh, realizing where I quoted, where I found the initial research when I quote these things. Uh, I give credit, a lot of credit to Montier because a lot of the stuff is in, in his little book. I think it's literally one of those little books on behavioral finance. I don't agree with everything he says in there, but it is a worth read. It is a little um, – you could read it pretty quickly. He does some good things in there. They talk a little bit about fundamentals, and I got a problem with that. But the psychology of it makes sense. But the point I was trying to make is all these books kind of blend together. Uh, Beyond Fear and Greed, I think, is uh, the latest one that I read and that I ended up skimming most of it towards after a few chapters in because it all sort of sounded the same. They use a lot of the same research and all this stuff. So uh, I don't want to pick on any one, but that one didn't really jump out at me as a great book. But with any book, as long as you get a couple of ideas out of it, it's, it's worth its while. But anyway, in some of those books, and I'm not sure who to give credit to, long story endless, uh, I read that fear is a bigger motivator than reward. And if you – and I knew I was going to try not to get back to the Robert Frey uh, presentation that one of my clients sent me last week or well, last week, uh, last month. But you, the majority of the time, you end up in a state of regret, a state of drawdown, your observations, okay, or going to be negative observations. And since fear is a much bigger motivator than reward, it's going to stress you out by watching that screen too much, by making too many observations. And, and Mr. Frey said it was 75% of the time. And I, I know you guys are going to get sick of me saying that, but it's such a wonderful thing. And I know I'm going to kind of beat the dead horse. This morning, I put on a little Forex trade, and it initially was profitable, and I felt pretty good about that. And then it went to the negative column uh, right before this presentation. And I felt worse about that than I felt good about it being up earlier, if that makes any sense. So try not to watch the screen too much because you're going to put yourself into nearly a constant state of regret. As I often say, portfolio jump, let's say uh, 1% per 100K, so that's $1,000 in one day. And then the next day, let's say we give up half of that, okay? Well, net net over two days, you're still up, but you're not going to feel good about being up $500 or a half a percent or that portfolio, you're going to actually feel worse about the portfolio, even though you're up 
over the past couple of days. And then in a little while, we're going to get into thinking longer term. And it's not easy to do. Trust me. But we'll get to that. Ed Zakota says, does not look at the screen doing trading hours. Uh, I believe that. I met Ed. So to micromanage or not to micromanage, that is the question. And, and the answer is don't micromanage. And I told some, I'm not going to go into any anecdotes this week, but I've got quite a few on micromanagement. But it's tough. You're in a position and it looks like it's beginning to fail. As long as you have that stop in place, just let that stop get taken out and get out. And as I said last week, I said I wouldn't tell the story, but there's been many a times, and I told one particular story, but there's many a times early in my career, I would just say, F it, and get out right here. And then what's the stock or commodity do? It does this, it turns around, it goes right back up. Not all the time, but sometimes. And that obviously could be very frustrating. Now, let's talk about the, the money and position management as it relates to the open portfolio and how I track this. By the way, and I forgot it was even there. So if, if any of you who are on a trading service, there is a spreadsheet. If you, if you hover over your name when you log into the trading service, you'll see my files. And if you click on that, you could download this file. Anyone who's not on the service, I'll still give you the file. And it's uh, it's a little dated, but all the all the uh, formulas are correct. So you'll get the exact formulas that's in this. And all you have to do is punch in your information. So here's the open portfolio. And I'm going to go ahead and do a little walkthrough on this because I haven't done a walkthrough in quite a while. And I still get a lot of questions. To make matters easy I track it on a hypothetical account size of 100k now it's always 100k like down here you'll see that we have uh, 11k ish open profits but when we go to put on the next trade we're not compounding in based on this hypothetical portfolio now in your own portfolio yes you would want to compound in okay but to make matters easy and to avoid confusion, I assume there's always 100K, whether there's 20K open profits or even open losses, okay? I always just make keep the math easy with 100K. Now, the risk per trade is going to be a constant 2% per trade. Why 2%? Well, anything bigger is, is, is just too much risk from what I've seen. And 2% is fairly big, too. You could get into a lot of trouble at 2%. Anything smaller than 2% doesn't seem to be enough to make things meaningful. It just a, doesn't seem to be worthwhile. But, yes, I mean, if you're blessed with a, a huge account or whatever, then maybe you want to back off a little bit and trade less and just keep, uh, you know, keep stay conservative or something. But that 2% seems to be a, a, a good, happy medium. So just enough risk to where it hurts, but enough – to where it also gives you a decent reward when you're right. And I've doodled with everything over the years. Now, the risk is always going to be 2%. If you're newer to trading, then maybe risk 1% or a half percent or a quarter percent, whatever it is. But whatever you risk, you must keep it constant and then gradually jump in size. And I see it happen all the time. Somebody risk quarter percent or a half percent. And they risk a half percent, half percent, half percent, and they, they make money on three trades. They feel pretty good. Then they risk 2%, and then they hit a losing trade. So they go back to a half percent, make money, make money, make money, go to 2%, lose money, and then the vicious cycle continues, and they just kind of slowly spiral down. So you have to be consistent at what you're doing and slowly work up to that 2%. That 2% assumes that you know what you're doing. And by the way, I don't want to digress too far. But it's hard to talk about money management without talking about psychology, and it's also hard to talk about money management without talking about the methodology. If you get better and better and better at your methodology, if you get better and better and better through deliberate practice, as I often preach, at your stock picking, if you're looking at the charts every day, and you're not just like 
flipping through them and not don't care what's going on. You're like looking at each one, and I'm not saying spend an enormous amount of time in each one, but if you see a stock that takes off, slow down, take a look at that stock, and see if one of your patterns was actually there. And if not, then that's okay. But then also ask yourself, could you have caught that pattern? And do that every day, every day, and you're going to get better and better and better at it. So the point I'm trying to get to here is garbage in, garbage out. If your stock selection becomes better, if only there were a 14-hour course in stock selection at DaveLander.com, then – sounds like the subliminal guy on uh, SNL. Uh, then if your stock selection, stock selection has gotten better, then you're going to have fewer losses in your portfolio. So your money management is going to start working better and better. You're going to be more likely to take a loss when that stop is hit because you know that that stinker is taking up space in your portfolio for the next winter. You're also going to feel better about yourself. So there's the methodology, making the money management work. And there's the money management working, making you feel better. So it's nearly impossible. In fact, it is impossible to talk about one aspect of trading without bringing in the other two. So make sure, as we used to say in the, in the programming days back uh Early in my, uh, I guess, IT career and, and, and late college, uh, garbage in, garbage out. So make sure you have the best trades to begin with. Now, getting back to the portfolio, if you take your account size, risk per trade, multiply that out, you're going to get $2,000 risk per trade. Now, that does not mean, and, and I'm surprised how often I get asked this, that does not mean, and, and I know you guys are rolling, some of you guys are rolling your eyes, just bear with me for the doobies. That does not mean you buy $2,000 worth of a stock. You buy $2,000 if stopped out. Okay? So in order to make that calculation, divide $2,000 by what you're risking. Now, the risk, you cannot use a fixed risk on each trade. There's a popular methodology that says you should risk 8% per trade. That's like saying that everyone should wear a medium-sized shirt, something my fat ass hasn't done since he was four years old, okay? Since I was four years old. <laughs> uh, it depends on the volatility of the stock. In this particular case, this one was pretty volatile, but when we look at the actual chart, again, we're going to look at this one uh, this is the one we just looked at. But we're going to take another look at it in just a minute. You'll see that that stop really didn't look like it was that far away. Percentage-wise, yes, it's about 34% away. But on the chart and technically-wise, it really wasn't that far away. I did two presentations back-to-back -back just on setting stops. And if you go to my YouTube channel, uh, subscribe to it while you're there if you don't mind. If you're watching this video on YouTube and you like it, subscribe to it. Uh, like it, subscribe to it, leave a comment, all these things. All these things helps uh, YouTube like me, and then doing so, it helps the channel grow, and it, it just kind of self-perpetuates. But if you don't like me, and then it's not going to help me much. <laughs> so anyway, so if you divide by that uh, – Okay, uh, Sven, it just you have to email me because I can't, uh, I can't send you a spreadsheet through the um, – Go to webinar. So go ahead and watch those videos. It, it, there's a lot of good stuff. Like somebody was asking me about TKOs last week, and I went to my YouTube channel and did a search on TKOs, and I found half a dozen videos on it. In fact, I think I spent like two weeks just talking about TKOs. So there's a lot of good free information out there on, on the YouTube channel. So check that out and, and do subscribe while you're there. And that helps that information float up on YouTube. It's kind of like a Google thing. Whoever's the most popular stays most popular. Anyway, so do watch those videos on setting stops. And I'll give you a few. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about it when we get to the charts. But the bottom line is uh, common sense is your best ally. Make sure it's far enough away. It looks like it's always $3 and something. That's not the case. It just so happens that it worked out based on these uh, I wouldn't say lower price stocks, but relatively lower price to possibly what you might have seen longer term in the markets. Once you divide that out, it's going to give you the number of shares. And I've divided those shares by two. And one's going to be trending and one's going to be trading. One's a swing trade and one is what is in place for, and there's that word again, hopefully a longer term trade. Now, you wouldn't buy, what's 317 times two? 
is uh, 634. So you wouldn't buy 634 shares. You just round that one way or the other. In this case, let's just say 600 shares. But for tracking purposes, to keep the math easy, and again, you could uh, I'll get you the spreadsheet. If you're not in a service, just email me. We keep the actual shares there. So we're looking for a 1% gain on the first loaf and hopefully many times that amount on the second. Now the first one is just going to be a swing trade and we want that to unfold in an ideal world over let's say two to five days. Sometimes it takes a little longer like this like this particular stock for instance it took a couple of weeks but that's okay. And then the second loaf is going to be that trend trade now here are our goals one-to-one -one risk reward on the first loaf so if we're risky two percent this is a one percent gain and notice how the math works pretty easy with this 100k account because one percent of 100k is what one thousand dollars and then on the second loaf we want many times that risk and this is the secret sauce in addition to that widening stop, which keeps you in this trade, which we'll look at in just one second. But the secret sauce is the many times risk. Some of the system development people, the problem with system development people is that they try to quantify everything and markets aren't normally distributed and you can't necessarily quantify everything. But it makes so much sense on paper, like risk one, one, and then your goal is going to be three. Well, that's fine and dandy, but if you're risking one with a goal of three, you are going to be three times more likely to get stopped out just on noise alone or just the fact that it's much easier for a market to make a one-time move than it is to make a three-time move, okay? And I've got plenty of videos on the negative expectancy, so if you can't sleep at night, uh, go in and watch those on YouTube. And as uh, my buddy Greg also says, just don't operate any heavy machinery after vi after viewing. He was talking about his videos, not mine, but um, that's a kind of a funny thing. So again, this is what you're looking for. You're looking for many times on that second loaf, and and that's where the money is, okay? And that's the secret to making things work. And if you look at the open portfolio, this is as of last night. You can see. The second loaf on two of those trades is about $7,700 or $7,800 and change. And then those swing trades also helped out, helps out too. So that's $7,800, let's say $8,000, keep the math easy, $9,000, $10,000, eleven. dollars So nearly all of the gains in the open portfolio are based on these two trades. The swing trade does help a little bit. And in this particular case, we'll, I'll show you in just one second. You got a little bit more than that 1% out because it gapped. Surprises usually or normally happen in the direction of the trend, and that can make your swing trade work out very nicely, okay? Because you get a little bit more than you're looking for. Not that anything bad could happen, but sometimes you do get a little more you're looking for. Now, before we move on to the next... Um, phase. Any questions on this? I'm not going to spend a lot of time, more time on the portfolio, so don't worry. Uh, but any quick questions on this, or uh, at the at the worst, I could um, at the least I could point you in the right direction. All right. So this is uh, the label got chopped off on this chart, but this is this is the pie trade, and this is a few days old. But let me just show you how this would set up. This set up as a hot IPO pullback. And this was one that we were long and we stopped out at a swing trade. And then we went back to the well because it looked pretty good. So we had a buy in here based on the pullback. And then we had a stop down there. Now, percentage wise, that's a pretty big stop. But looking at it at the chart, it doesn't look like it's really that far away at all from the bottom of the pullback. And obviously, any trade, no matter how well thought and how great you are, and if you're a fantastic stock picker, even like Big Dave, we know that you can get stopped out and the trade might not work. 
Now, this is where we took partial profits. Now, our profit target was here, but fortunately, it gapped through that profit target. And if you're willing to apply a little bit of discretion, sometimes you could actually trail that stop intraday. Not that I want you to be too hands-on, but when blessed with a profit like this, sometimes you could actually squeeze out a little bit more. But based on this open, it turned out to be 1.5% total on the uh, overall portfolio versus 1%. And then so far, it's rallied nicely in here. Now, you stay with that trade by a gradually widening op um, gradually widening protective stop. So you can see that you have this fairly tight swing trade stop. And then you let that gradually open up as the market moves more and more in your favor. And the idea is to ride out some corrections along the way. And then so far, so good, knock on wood, the stock has begun to take off again. Okay. Okay, Donald says, speaking of pie, I recently pulled back and is now breaking out to all-time highs. Unfortunately for me, I missed the entry. Would have, could have, should have. It was wondering if the entry methods call for an entry in the pullback. I actually told everybody to service that it didn't pull back quite enough for my taste based on the magnitude of the move. Uh, when we get to the actual charts, I'll pull it up and we'll take a look at the live chart on that. Uh, but that's the thing with IPOs is it, as I often say, you you could especially when you're in an IPO bull market like we've been in for the past several years, you could bend not break but bend the rules a little bit. He's like, okay, this thing's really hot. I wish it would have pulled back more. Ideally, it should have pulled back more, but maybe I'm going to make an exception to where it's not pulled back as deep enough as I'd like. But it is an IPO. It is on fire. I think it's worth a shot. So as long as you could reason through all that going in, and as I often say, obsess before you get into trade, not afterwards, then you should you should do just fine. And then the other thing I often preach too is you have to also ask yourself, could you walk away and be okay? Now, getting back to that CNX trade, this was the bow tie, and that was way back in February. And this is the ultimate goal on every trade to end up in longer term trend following mode. I'm slotted as a swing trader, probably because my publisher put swing trader, my publisher back then I should say, put swing trader on the first two books. But I've always been willing to stay with positions a little bit longer term. In fact, a lot of it longer term in some cases. So this was the trigger on the bow tie. And that left us with a protective stop down here. Now, remember earlier I said that protective stop was 34% away. Well, that protective stop is, doesn't even look like it's that far below the low, but that's what the position called for because this move is a lot bigger than you than it looks, and the stock is a lot more volatile than it looks on the surface. So that was our buy, and then our we took initial profits up at this level here, and then we ended up with a gradually widening trailing stop throughout. And Obviously, when the market goes higher, the stop goes higher. When the market comes back in, the stop stays where it is. And then when the market goes higher, the stop begins to trail higher again. But you can see that this stop gets wider and wider with time. I mean, look at it back here and then look at it here. That's a secret sauce. And I thought like Pinocchio being a bad motivational speaker, you know, I see potential in you and you. You know, it's like I thought everyone knew that. But as I said before, I was on a project with a bunch of brainiacs once, and uh, I was very humbled to be on this project. And then a few weeks into the project, a few weeks after I began recommending trades, first few weeks, I didn't have anything to recommend. And they said, hey, that's okay. No problem. Wait until you see something that's really good, that's really worthwhile. And I luckily, I started hitting it out of the park. And one of the guys, guys, I think he's got a PhD who was tracking everything, and, and he was a trader also, was saying, hey, it's really neat the way Dave is taking those partial profits out, taking that risk off, but then letting the stop open up to capture longer-term gains, and that's really working out great. And I just thought everybody knew that, but apparently it's not common knowledge. So I know I beat the dead horse on a lot of these little simple concepts, but sometimes – Simple things aren't necessarily common knowledge. 
So this is how it's it's, it's uh, shaped up so far on the CNX, and the ultimate goal is to ride out that longer term trend. Now this it's kind of painful to if you're watching every tick, okay. So do you really want to watch every tick for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, going on eight months? That's a lot of energy when there's really nothing to do, okay, other than make sure that stops in place and go about your life. Once you get into this longer-term trend-following mode, you're in a wonderful place, okay? All you have to do, I know easier said than done, you know, like my wife, all you have to do is just fix that leak. It's like, uh, <laughs> it's not that easy. Just tighten it up. <laughs> but really, all you have to do is leave that stop in place and forget about it. Once you're in this wonderful place of longer term trend following, there is, yes, there's a little bit to do back here, okay? Because you have to put the inner and get your stop set up. You have to take partial profits. And there might be a tiny bit of discretion in all this. As I often say, discretion can make your trading much, much better. But it's not all day, every day. Usually from from what I've seen, with my stuff at least, it's about once every three months you're, you're offered an opportunity where discretion can make your trade a little bit better. Like, uh, for instance, I'll give you an example. The uh, Pi or the open a gap, if memory serves, I think that's, that one ran up a little bit, at least on the open, or I've seen it happen before at least, where you exceed your profit target and it keeps on going, so you could squeeze out a little bit more on the trade. So there's a little bit to do back here, but for the most part, once you have the luxury of sitting of uh, being in this longer-term trend-following mode, you could sit back and relax. I know, easy, huh? But, ha -ha. but it can be done. It can be done. And all you have to do is just do it, okay? I know. So we're in longer-term trend following mode. Now, again, like I said, it looked like it was going to roll over here. Uh, it was dead money here. It went on to make new highs. Dead money here. Had a sell signal here. And now it's going on to make new highs. There's nearly always a reason to exit, or there's always a reason to exit, and rarely a reason to stay with the trade. You could you could reason yourself out of a lot of good trades, but if you just let the stop do the work for you, then you'll stay with the trade. Now, what other point I want to make on this one? What I like about this stock is, and it's not nearly as exciting as something like the pie. It just goes triggers, it takes off, it goes to the moon, and I look like a genius. And everybody's happy. And everybody's giving me high fives and kissing each other. I mean, that's fun. And I love that. It ultimately, yeah, that'd be great if every trade did that. But the reality is those type of moves usually aren't that sustainable. I'd much rather have a stock trigger and then work its way to that initial profit target, consolidate, take off again, consolidate, take off again, consolidate, take off again. Because this is much healthier for a market. And my own thoughts and my thoughts of clients and my thoughts of uh, or the uh, the emails I get, kind of that um, collective helps me to wrap my head around how technical analysis works. So what happens is obviously some people probably exited on this bow tie or whatever signal that may have been or the fact that they're just losing money in the trade. So once that selling is out the way, it clears the way for the stock to go higher. And then they're going to have to put up or shut up and decide whether or not they want to get back in. So when a stock consolidates, it takes off again, consolidates, maybe even shakes out a little bit, takes off again, it becomes a longer-term sustainable move. And that's sometimes where the money is. And although it's kind of hard to see it just kind of uh, day by day by day by day, but – eight, nine, ten months, a year, two years, three years down the road, if you're still in that trade, it turns out to work pretty nicely. And in this particular case, it's a, I think it's 100% so far, okay? So that's 100%, 10 months, eh, better than a poke in the eye, right? Now, a couple of random thoughts in here. Make sure you're in the long run for the methodology. Uh, people will look at my stuff and say, uh, hey, I didn't do too good. I, I, yeah, I took a trial. I didn't do do so well over three weeks, four weeks time. 
It's like, well, you, you really have to look at a, look at things longer term. And that goes for any methodology. Uh, I can speak best about my methodology, but it pretty much goes for any methodology. You have to stick around long enough to reap the fruits of your labor. Now, I guess I need to throw in any viable methodology. Make sure it's a viable methodology, okay, and not some sort of get-rich-quick thing or so-called income producing strategy. You need to run away from those. I don't want to get stuck in that reversion to the mean or option selling uh, diatribe that I normally go into. But just as long as it's a viable methodology, you have to stick around long enough to reap the fruits of your labor. So you may not have a positive experience over a few weeks, but longer term trends will show up. Longer terms, you will have the C index of the pie. And over the past several weeks, that observation, I was looking at that because somebody was asking me about that. Said, hey, it didn't do so well in the trial. I was like, well, let's take a look at it. There were no losing trades, okay, open losses, yes, but no losing trades during that period. And also, if you added everything up, the portfolio jumped about 30% uh, as far as open gains or concern. However, if you're just getting started, you, you're not in some of those winners that have continued on. So hopefully that makes sense that things have done well, but if you're just coming in, obviously you don't have the benefit of those prior positions. And there will be extended flat times. As I often preach, you have to know the nuances of your methodologies. I talk quite a bit about this over the last couple of weeks, especially in my last column. You have to know that it's it's going to take time, and you might have to wait six to eight months and occasionally a little longer. But longer term, you'll be pleasantly surprised. That's what my methodology or trend following in general. The only caution I would give you with trend following in general is it's going to have really steep drawdowns. So you might want to make sure you have some sort of hybridized approach like I have where you're taking those short-term profits just in case that trend doesn't happen. And that trend, by the way, and I don't want to get too far in statistics because I just beat up the statisticians a few minutes ago, but from my own testing, there's probably a 70% chance that it's not going to turn into the mother of all trends. Because from my own testing, it seems like as a longer-term trend follower, you're only going to be right about 28% of the time, as I often preach. But as a swing trader, you're going to be right a lot more than that. And if you're willing to bank those profits and then hang on and give up that swing trade profit for when it doesn't work out and stick around for when it does, that 28% of the time, which is probably going to end up to be a fairly valid statistic longer term, is going to be well worth it. You're going to have those occasional big outliers like we talked about. And by the way, again, you really need to know your nuances when you're talking, when you're thinking about a uh, methodology. Uh, yeah, we could, we could go ahead and open up for stocks. I'll, I'll, I'll get there in just a few minutes. Just bear with me and I'm, I'm almost there, I promise. But you really have to know your nuances regardless of the methodology. And I said I wasn't going to pick on reversions to the mean. But it's just such a blatantly obvious thing to to see with the reversion to the bead. You make a little, make a little, make a little, and then you get wiped out. Okay, that's a little bit easier to see. With my stuff, there's a lot more nuances in that. There's flat times, and then that, uh, of course, there will be losses. And then sometimes you just kind of chip away at it, where you grind it out, make a little, lose a little, make a lose a little, lose a little. And if you can stick with it longer term. You will occasionally hit it out of the park. You will occasionally get those big home runs. But the other nuance is without those home runs, you're going to be mediocre at best. So a little bit more complex to explain all the nuances of a hybridized approach to trend following. But wrapping your head around them and understanding them goes a long ways towards your success. So a couple of other random thoughts in here. Again, uh, reduce... Your observations, I'm getting ready to talk about that one, Jerry. In fact, you read my mind. Um, reduce your observations. And again, the more you look at that screen when there's nothing to do, the more you're going to put yourself into a state of regret. And I know I'm going to keep beating a dead horse on that. And trust me, I have these own emotions. I have these own feelings. 
and act in, in an irrational way or feel like I want to act in an irrational way. And you can't constantly put yourself in that state. As I said, I get tired of me saying the same stuff over and over, so just hang with me. But as I said quite often, a lot of times I look at the screen and get all pissed off. And then I'll go for a walk. And, and I live in the country, so if I go around the block, it's it's roughly two miles. So by the time I get back all sweaty – and everything, I've kind of cooled, I've kind of uh, mentally cooled off at least. And I look at my screen, it's like, oh, well, everything came back. Not every time, but many times that's happened. And I realize I've wasted all that mental energy for nothing. So be cognizant of your feelings, reduce your observations, so you're not putting yourself into that so-called state of regret. Now, I beat the dead horse on this a lot too. Follow your plan. You do have a plan, right? And I think the reason people don't plan, as I often say, is because the moment you put a plan in place, that's the moment you have to accept the fact that you could be wrong. And we as human beings don't like to be wrong. Okay? Now, here's the thing. Was your plan not to follow the plan, which is fine as long as that becomes a new plan? Where am I going with that? Well, I got an email from somebody with the mime, which is uh, what Jerry's asking about. I had a stock on the service, and it was a pullback. Now, I took it off because it went numerous days without triggering. And then what happened? Well, it finally took off. Now, several days after I took it off, a client took it, or he took it even though it didn't trigger. He wasn't following the plan. And he said, hey, Dave, I'm following the plan because even though it gapped against me, I kept my stop in place. Well, my point was, if your plan was not to follow the plan, then you're doing okay. But this could be, and this is a, a sign, this could be a sign of winging it. So if you go in and say, okay, Dave took it off his list. I still think it looks good. I still think it's worthwhile. I'm going to still take the trade. And if I do get into the trade, if it does trigger it, then I'm going to follow the plan and put the stop in, et cetera, et cetera. So if your plan is not to follow the plan, that's fine as long as you make that your new plan. The problem becomes if you are kind of winging it, oh, I'm going to take it anyway, and not have a plan in place, then a couple of things obviously could happen. One, it will shake you out. It then takes off without you, which psychologically is going to be really tough. Or two, let's say it doesn't shake you out. It does take off. Now you have a big winner on your hands, but that came from not following the plan. So the market rewarded bad behavior. So as I said, was your plan not to follow the plan, which is fine as long as that becomes your new plan. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, Jerry wants me to comment on this. Well, the thing was, and I forget exactly day, uh, what day I took it off, but initially I liked the way it looked when it was somewhere in here, but it kept pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, pulling back. And we had a fairly liberal entry, okay? So had the entry been here, then we probably would have been okay, even with this little shakeout here. But the reason I had a liberal entry was because it's a fairly volatile stock, I mean, it's doubled over a short period of time. So I wanted to make sure, help ensure that it didn't just kind of trigger and then die uh, on noise alone. In this, in this particular case, it didn't work out, and the stock took off anyway. That's fine, okay? And if you did take the trade, as long as you had a bona fide plan in place for taking the trade, then that's fine too. So, yeah, it's just too many days of the pullback. I think I took it off. I forget exactly when, but let's count them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And then I guess if you count that one, 15. But I think we took it off somewhere in here when it was like 13, 14 days into the trade. Okay, somewhere in here, I think. So, yeah, you know, you can't kiss all the women. No methodology is perfect. What are you going to do? Okay. And the reason I don't want to claim I don't want to claim victory or anything on this because the stock took off and it was on my list is because if I do that, then if this stock 
if other stocks like this, when I let's say I take them off here, begin to die, then I'm going to have to take credit for those too. So I can only take credit for the ones that I recommend that actually trigger, obviously. But yeah, it doesn't hurt to be in the hunt. You know, as my wife often says when I miss a big trade, she'll say, well, at least it was on your radar. Okay, a couple of announcements, and then we'll hop into the uh, overall charts. Uh, could you say the following plan is more important in the long run than making the trade? Could you say that following the plan in the long run is more important than making the trade? I'm not sure what you're asking. Um, so let me talk a little bit about both of those things. It, go ahead and ask, re-ask or rephrase that if you wouldn't mind. But following a plan is the thing to do, okay, versus taking a trade like this even though it worked out. That's where the market could be a bad teacher. Now, you might pick it apart and say, well, it wasn't that, it wasn't that bad. It really didn't do anything that wrong, and it took off, so it wasn't that big a deal. But as a general statement, and this this is kind of hard. It's took me a, it, it's taken me a long time to reach this point where I think like this. You have to have some rules in place to where, and they can be fairly flexible. They don't have to be totally rigid. But after ten days of pulling back, that stock has gone two weeks without forward progress. At that point, you have to think, okay, is this still a pullback or is this some sort of bona fide reversal? And then into day 11, day 12, day 13, at some point, you have to have a number of days where, you know what, I'm just going to take it off the list. And then I'm working a lot of, on trading psychology in this beginner's course, and you guys can go back and watch. You know, I'm using some of the same slides that I used a while back on YouTube where I talk about when you make a decision, you have emotions and stress attached. So trading is all about making decisions and then, of course, living with those decisions. So as long as you can live with the decision you make, then your life never gets easy as a trader, but it gets much easier. So I'm living with the decision of, okay, it pulled back so many days. I'm following my system. My plan is to avoid trades after so many days. I can be a little flexible in that because that's in the planning phase. You don't have to be completely rigid in, in the planning phase. You do have a little flexibility. And this is all done after hours, so you have time to look at things really carefully and then make that plan. My plan was, well, you know what? Too many days on the list. Too many days is a setup. Pull back too many days. I'll take it off. So I made the decision, and then you know what? I have to live with it, okay? Yeah, it'd be nice to be in it. It'd be nice to be making a big profit, but you have to live with that decision. And living with that decision means that sometimes you'll miss some winning trades, okay? Also wondering how you plan for an election year, if at all. No, uh, nothing. Uh, keep the stock picks coming. We're getting, we're almost there. Uh, I don't do anything for an election year. Uh, a couple years back, I guess it was 2013 or whatever. I try to, I kind of, they all kind of blur together, except a year like obviously 2007, 2008, uh, 2009 was the bottom. You know, <laughs> 1999, everything was straight up, but everything in between kind of blurs together. But I think it was 2013 was a really choppy year, and I think we had a crappy summer, if memory serves. I try to forget about losses as quickly as possible. And who was the trade that says, forget about losses as quickly as possible and forget about winners even even quicker. I guess it's so it doesn't go to your head. But anyway, I remember back then, after a crappy summer, somebody sent me an email says, everybody knows you, you, you should sell a bay and go away. Well, that's a cute little saying, which it, it isn't true, by the way. Uh, Tom McClellan's done a lot of research there and gave a wonderful wonderful speech on that a few years uh, ago to us at the uh, American Association of Professional Technical Analysts Conference uh, down here in New Orleans. But the point is, it doesn't always work that way. So we had a pretty good summer, and we've been having a pretty good year in spite of it being lecture year, in spite of trading through summer, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Yes, if the market gets choppy in the middle of summer, be very selective. Right now, the market's trying to find its way, chop it around a little bit. We haven't had a whole lot of new setups come on. In fact, I don't have anything recommended uh, in today's service. So I would not 
take into consideration election year. All that stuff, I think, is academic at best. And you have to be really careful. Even if there is an edge, which there is in some of this stuff, some of the seasonal trading, some of uh, these other things. I think Tom McClellan went on to uh, say that actually if you sold in June, it would test out. Uh, but all these things, you have to be careful, especially seasonal biases like this and, and election cycles, because you only have – you don't have a representative sample. You have a very small observation. So it could be right. I'm sorry. It could be wrong for several years in a row. Let's say election year cycle every four years. So that could be wrong, let's say, for the next 12 years. And that statistical bias is still in place. So for 12, you're going to be wrong those next 12 years about the election cycle. And then it starts working again? No, you can't do that, okay? You always have to ask yourself, I guess, two questions. One, as Einstein said, is a universe friendly? But more importantly, when it comes to trading, you always have to ask yourself, is it tradable? Is it tradable or academic? If it's academic, study all you want. Uh, it, it just That's for entertainment purposes only, okay? Can you actually trade off of it? If the answer is no, then toss it aside okay so be really careful uh, a couple of announcements real quick uh this is left in from weeks or actually months ago i'm working on a beginner's course and, and what's kind of cool about this is is i'm kind of going back in time mentally and like what would i have wanted to know what did i need to know many many years ago 20 something years ago and it's it's obviously the psychology of yourself and how you view the markets. The mentality, as I've talked about recently, is so much more important than anything else. And I know you guys that have been doing this for a long time are going to go back and watch a beginner's course. But in some cases, that's exactly what you should do. When you find yourself not following the plan, when you find yourself micromanaging, when you find yourself over trading, when you find yourself trading for excitement and a plethora of other problems, then I would say go back to the basics and start over, okay? And I knew a trader years and years ago who was pretty complex in his analysis, but whenever he hit a pretty bad slump, he would actually go back to the beginning in his own stuff and trade one little simple pattern until he got his mojo back on, and then he would start adding in his more complex stuff. Now, I'm not saying go through all that, but I'm saying that sometimes, especially if you're making these very obvious and blatant mistakes, go back to the beginning, go back to the start. And I think, um, uh, I mean, I know, I even quoted John Bollinger in here. And it's, um, well, it's kind of like it goes back to the old um, – What's the old quote? Uh, we shall never cease, cease from exploring. And in that, uh, we arrive at the beginning for the first time. I forget exactly how it goes. I had the slides. Uh, but John Bolger had a, a true enlightenment comes when you reach the beginning. And he was talking about Albert Eiler, who someone said that he became so advanced at his music that he came back in at the beginning. Okay, That's a little esoteric, but if you've been doing this for a while – It'll make a lot of sense. And that's kind of, that's, you know, not, not to be egotistical, but that's kind of where I am. It's like I went through all this complexity and all this stuff, and now I feel like I'm almost coming back in at the beginning. And that's kind of the epiphany with the course. It's like the stop versus the bow tie sell or some of the kind of more complex sell signal, some sort of complex thing that's going to get me out to maximize the maximize of the trend and not get just the whipsawed. Instead of doing all that thinking, it's like, well, no, I just have this stop, and that's going to take care of that for me. So it's kind of like back to the beginning, just use a stop. Anyway, hopefully that made sense. If not, <laughs> let me know. Uh, make sure you're on the delayed service, by the way. Uh, so if you are, if you do want to follow along, make sure you, uh, you're watching that delayed uh, service so you have a good feel for what's uh, actually happening. Both good and bad. So if you've been watching the delays since February, 
day by day by day. Now, I am a little delayed in getting them out sometimes, so be patient with me there. But at least you'll have a feel for how this all unfolded. So this CNX trade that we're in now, you would have seen it back in February, about a week or so after we put it on. The pie trades, the two pie trades we had, PI, you would have seen those unfold past several weeks. So do get into that. Uh, I think if you go to my website under um, – if you go to my website under uh, getting started, you'll uh, have access to that uh, getting started. How many times I have to tell you every Thursday at 10 I do a webinar? Anyway, uh, let's hop into the charts. Margin call. <laughs> Don't answer it. All right. Uh, yeah, keep the questions coming, and let's let's take a look at these. All right. Uh, before we get into individual picks, let's um, let's take a look at the overall market, and then the sector action, and then let's take a look at a few commodities, possibly and bonds, and et cetera. So let's take a look at. The overall market. Let's take a look at the P's. Okay, P's are getting kind of choppy in here, and you've got to be really careful. One thing I was thinking about this morning, coming in to today's presentation, is that we're really in a market now that you have to be careful not to chase your own tail. We had this huge sell-off not that long ago, and then it popped right back. So in this huge sell-off, you would you would just throw in a towel, exit everything, and the next day, market goes straight back up. Not quite a do-over, but pretty dang close, okay? And then begins to sell off again, but then it comes back. And then chop, 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 took off, looked like it was going back to brand new highs, sold off hard, took off again, and now eh, kind of a shoulder shrug today. So you have to be really careful not to chase your own tail and follow the ups and downs too much. Now, when I find myself in a market like this, I always remember to look at the net, net price change, the most simplest form Ever of technical analysis, I can't. You, you can't get any more simpler. Okay, the net net change. Go back to the middle of July. So for two and a half months on a net net basis, look at this percent change: 0.13. Uh, market rallies 0.13, then or goes down to 0.13, then it's actually zero for two and a half months. So. Never forget about the net net. When you do see a market like this, you need to be, this is a technical term, so bear with me, super duper selective if you're stock picking. And what we have found in more recent times, I'll, I'll get to that uh, question, Pamela, one second. What we found in more recent times is that the more speculative issues have been offering the best opportunities. And then going back, to February, obviously, some commodities actually worked out pretty good, too. The great thing about those type of issues is that they could trade contra or in spite of the overall market. And that's why we've been finding those setups there. So P's are kind of sideways. The The only takeaway that I have, a good takeaway, is that don't short a market when it's at or near or not too far from all-time highs. And as I said a couple of days ago, let's see, we were about what 1.38% away from all-time highs. So one or two big updates puts you back to new highs, but obviously you still have to get there. Now, the great thing is we haven't seen a whole lot of setups lately, and sometimes you just have to sit on your hands. And that's what I was preaching about earlier is that you have to be patient. And that's with any methodology, not just mine, to reap the fruits of your labor. Um, somebody might come in here, oh, this trend following sucks, and then what happens? They quit, and then, bam, market just goes to the moon. Now, I know we've had a pretty good – we've done okay during this period, but that's just kind of an example. Usually, in a sideways market, we don't do that well. 
Okay. So I don't want to make you think that no matter what happens, we do well. It's just fortunately by being selective, we've been able to get in some decent stocks. NASDAQ really hasn't made a whole lot of forward progress in quite a while too. It did break out to all time highs just recently came back, as I said, in the market in a minute and service, maybe just kind of kiss that range. Goodbye. Took off a little bit, stalling on a little bit today. So be careful not to chase your tail there too. But you probably want to err on the side of longer-term trend. And that's why you haven't seen me throw out a lot of shorts lately because the market is not too far from all-time highs. I almost put one in today's service just because I like the setup. So if you really like a setup, regardless of the market is doing, take it. But if, you've, if you're not incredibly excited about the setup – and the market doesn't confirm your setup, then, and, and the sector doesn't confirm either, then don't take it. Okay, that's kind of your litmus test for that. And the reason we didn't take it was it was a little thin, a little bit on the thin side. And we'll talk about it next week. And get under the late service, you'll see it next, uh, what's today, Thursday? Next Thursday. Uh, by the way, I might not be doing a chart show next Thursday. I have to fly out like early in uh, that. Uh, the next morning uh, for Traders for a Cause. Uh, it's a charity event. So any of you guys going to be in Vegas or near Vegas or whatever gives you an excuse to go there. Uh, it's a write-off, FYI. Russell 2000, stalling out a little bit today. Had a good day yesterday. Not too far from multi year highs. I wouldn't count it down and out just yet. But, yes, I am a little concerned about the net-net price change here, too. Let's take a look at some of these sectors. One thing I want to point out here. Let's take a look at like a let's take a look at a monthly or a weekly on the energy. Let's take a look at a weekly maybe. If a stock or a sector is coming off a of major highs like in 2007, we shorted the energies back in 2007. I remember that was some of our big winners. I'm sure we probably put on a few back here. I'm not as excited about shorting them in here because they're coming off of, what, like a seven, eight-year lows. So this could just be a leg up. Not that I do this big picture or huge picture technical analysis, but as a general statement, I'd much rather short a market way up here than at relatively low levels. Now, on a micro level, you need to think twice before you're shorting like a commodity because sometimes commodities they have long, uh, nine lives, especially when they're in this kind of longer term recovery mode. So you can see they're still in this trend from February and so far, this has just been a big consolidation. Now, even if they break down below this, I don't think it's worth it because they'll probably just come back to their old lows and, and consolidate. OK, we'll, we'll see. We'll know when it happens. Right. Or we'll see. We'll decide when it happens. But we did have a decent day yesterday at energy's up about four percent. Metals and mining bouncing back too. Metals and mining look a little bit more dubious, but again, these guys are coming off of uh, serious, serious longer term lows. So this could just be a consolidation before the next leg up. But wait for setups here, okay? Goro was another one. That's another one of those ones that, and I know some of you guys took it, uh, but that's fine as long as that's the plan. Here was another case where I took this one off the list. It was too many days of the pullback. And then it took off. Uh, now, this doesn't always happen. But if you decide to take a trade that looks like this, then by not following the plan, make sure that that becomes your new plan. Okay? It, because otherwise, you'll say, well, it stopped out, but I'm going to stick with it. And you'll keep, you'll keep planning as you go. No. Plan ahead of time. And if you haven't taken the trade yet, and I took it off my list, but you still like it, then that becomes your new plan. And as long as that's the plan from the get-go, then follow the plan and follow through. But uh, not a whole – this is kind of the exception. Golds have kind of been uh, – have really been taken off as of late. So I say wait for setups there. In general, you probably want to wait around for setups. Anything technology is looking a lot better than setups and then stocks in general or um, sectors in general, I should say. Semis just shy of all-time highs like the NASDAQ itself. Hardware doesn't look too bad. Software doesn't look too bad. So anything pretty much technology-related looking okay in here at or near or not too far from all-time highs. 
the interest rate sensitive areas or looks like they're putting in major tops but they're taking their own sweet time about it which is fine because bonds sold off hard which suggests rates are going to go higher but then bonds recovered a little bit into this resistance and then they're just kind of messing around in here i think we're going to see the mother of all tops and bonds at some point and i guess anybody can make that kind of statement right it's not a prediction it's just it will happen but until it does let's not get too excited about bonds my thinking with bonds is on the first wave down you're going to see a big huge panic in stocks or a fairly sizable panic in stocks and then people will come to their senses and say wait a minute interest rates went from 0.0001 to 0.001 that's still that that big of a deal is still zero and then we might have another leg up in stocks now you can't trade off that so what I just said was academic but sometimes it helps to have these plausible scenarios in your mind ahead of time so when it unfolds or if it unfolds in that said manner you're able to kind of wrap your head around what's going on okay Pamela says if you were asked to point someone to the best tutorial video what would you tell them uh, well, because I'm working so hard on it, and it's been 10 times more work than I thought it would ever be, I would say this course that I'm going to put out, and I'm going to put on, on beginner's course, and a lot of that's going to be put out for free. Um, I would just go through the YouTubes because a lot of the stuff, when I'm working on a course like this, a lot of this stuff finds itself into the YouTubes. I would definitely go to the stock selection course page on my website and watch the video on stock selection. And that's a um, that's free and it's on a website I would definitely go to the IPO page and watch the video on IPOs okay so those are probably the most actionable pages or actionable videos to watch depending on your level of trading you might want to then go back to the YouTube so if you go to um, If you go to the store and hit the stock selection course, if you click right here, there's a, about a one hour video on that page. And then if you hit the IPO one, there's about a one hour video on that page. People who know marketing tell me, Dave, you're only supposed to give them like 10 minutes. Well, I give you enough to get started. And if that, if that doesn't get you excited about it, then, you know, you, then you, you know, and then the other thing you could do is if you go to my YouTube channel, which I don't have up, but if you go to the YouTube channel and click on um, my channel and then click search, uh, you could search for individual patterns, the money management, the psychology, and all those things. And it'll be out there. So I don't really have any um, specific plan laid out as to what to watch, although I did start doing that. If you go into getting started on my website, if you're just getting started, then take the next step, go to get moving, and then the fast track, you'll have a list of a to-do list. That was kind of my goal there. I haven't quite finished it just yet. And then the only thing I'd point out, Pamela, is uh, I would also go to videos on my website, and there's some, uh, there's some videos that are organized there. But, yeah, I need to work a little bit better on getting everything organized, and it's getting there. Okay, uh, just about time to hop into individual stocks. Let's take a look at gold real quick. Gold's kind of choppy and sideways. I think longer term, gold's still putting in a bottom here. We did bow tie way back here. And let's see where we are on a weekly with gold. Yeah, we had a weekly bow tie. So I think the mother of all bottoms is in and gold. Unfortunately, it's going to be a choppy ride. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and open it up for, well, one other thing. A couple of areas in here not looking so hot like retail, but there is quite a bit of support under the market. So it is kind of mixed out there, but if the market starts banging out new highs, it's it's going to drag these areas up with it, okay? You're welcome, Pamela. There's plenty enough to keep you busy for a long, long time, and if you want to get, if you want to accelerate your learning, obviously there's courses, and uh, I, I'll help point you in the right direction and you could also with any course I give you lifetime support so you could always call me or email me any questions that you might have on that 
As, and now lifetime support is not, hey, Dave, can you help me build a trading system? No, we already built the system, but I'll help you understand it and implement it. Okay, nice webinar. LFC bow tie, 18th of July, in buy zone now. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Nah, who's lifetime? Mine or yours? I don't know, Pamela. How old are you? <laughs> uh, I have been. I know I make all the fat jokes, but I, I, I've i been working on it a little bit. I, the diet hasn't worked out so well, but uh, the exercise has. Um, yeah, this is one I've been watching. It's it's choppy because it's foreign, I guess, uh, but it did have a nice little bow tie back here. So it's no longer really a bow tie because that signal, that buy would have been way back here. I would now treat it as like a, a just a generic trend resumption type of pattern. And it looks okay. Maybe a little bit more knockout move. To be perfect, I'd like to see it. Let me just get a clean chart here. I'd like to see it pull back maybe like 12.50 or something. It's not bad, but it's 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 pretty choppy, and maybe that's just because it's a foreign stock. Okay. All right, uh, Pamela, I think you also want to know about Beeson. Oh, I asked. Yeah, I'm sorry. Did I just ask how old you were? B C U N. <laughs> well, judging from that reply, I'm going to say you're 29 years old, and have been for the last seven or eight years. Uh, yeah, Beeson's a little flat in here, so you can see it did have a little pullback back here, but now it's kind of flat, uh, and it's had quite the rally. And this is on uh, my momentum list right now. Reason I didn't like it here was it didn't pull back enough because it went up about 300% roughly, round numbers maybe. So when you see a move like this, you want to see a pretty big knockout, but now it's going sideways a little bit. I like to see it at least make, uh, somewhat well not marginal but all-time highs and then pull back from there so keep this one on your momentum list it's just not set up at this particular time bingo all right pamela pamela's 29 all right so now we know okay <laughs> cld yeah that weight thing too you got to be careful with huh I saw a lady with some guest jeans on once, and I said, it said guess, and I'm like, I don't know, 300? Uh, CLD, yeah, this needs to go on your watch list, okay? Not currently set up, obviously, but uh, nice big move, longer-term move off of lows. Uh, these, like, it's kind of like that CNX, you know, we're in longer-term trend-following mode. So next pullback here I think would be worthwhile. Absolutely put that on your watch list, okay? Jared, you have, I know we kind of beat that horse on mime. I still you, I, I haven't deleted your question yet, though. Did we cover everything on that for you? Uh, Jerry also wants to take a look at HZN, HZN. Yeah, again, another stock that needs to be on your watch list. A little bit on the thin side, though. Only uh, 150,000 shares on average. Relatively new issue. Uh, I call these toddlers. Uh, is, new issues that have been out for two, three years. Uh, they still could have some really nice moves. It broke out of its base, and then it didn't clear the space quite enough for my taste. So if it does resume its trend, wait to see if it resumes its trend, maybe get up to 22 or so, and then pulls back. But absolutely, that should go on your watch list for sure. Ren for Andre. That's going to be – Andre loves metals in mine. That's going to be a metal mining stock. $100 says. No, energies. Ah, I was wrong. There goes 100 bucks. Um. This one has a lot of overhead supply. This one has caught my eye quite a bit in recent times. But the amount of overhead supply is a little concerning. Now, I know it would be a good problem to have, I guess, if it rallied up that much. Uh, the other thing is it's had such a strong run in here. I would wait to see if it could continue higher and then play a pullback. But by the time it continues higher, and that's why I'm pointing out this, this overhead supply, by the time it continues higher and then pulls back, then it's too, going to be too close to this overhead supply. Uh, what was it about Goro that nudged you into removing it from your list? Number of days of the pullback, okay? Kind of like the mime, okay? So Goro, let's back this chart out a little bit. So Goro looked pretty good, right? Kind of starts pulling back in here. 
but then pulling back, pulling back, pulling back. A little gap down. I wouldn't get too excited about this gap, okay? Because it's a commodity-related stock and it's not that big of a gap. But it gapped down nonetheless. And then you start looking at the net net change based on this pullback. Still not bad if you're looking at this higher plus this. But now you got the gap. And now you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 days in there. So that's why I took it off. And then now you've got like 20 days of trading. Doesn't mean that it can't still take off. And it did. But it was just too many days pulling back. Okay, you, you have to have some rules and you have to follow them. They don't have to be exact, per, per, precise mechanical rules. You can use a little discretion. You can bend the rules a little bit. But the bending of the rules is in making of the plan. And you have to be fairly consistent in making of the plan. And then you have to be very consistent in following the plan, obviously. Look at the group Goro is in. It pulled back much more. Well, the golds, yeah, we could plot. Uh, we could put the gold underneath here. Let's put GLD underneath here, and let's take a look at that. I used to do a lot of this type of analysis early on. Let's see if we can. Um, my window won't come up. I can't find the window. It's buried somewhere. Let's see. Talk amongst yourselves. Where'd it go? Why well, don't let me edit this? Let's let's try again. Oops. I'm hearing this big ding in my head. <laughs> you guys can't hear that. I don't know if the mic's picking it up. All right, here we go. There it is. I've got a bunch of windows open, and it's hidden behind a window. So let's plot the comparison. Uh, let's change the comparison symbol. There it goes again, another ding. Let's change the comparison symbol to gold, the commodity, GLD. And that's going to be the ETF, obviously, for gold. And let's plot that. We can't plot any gold because we already have gold. Let's plot that in a, like something that's going to show up, like a cyan or something maybe. And let's make it visible. Okay, so his point is that it pulled back more than the sector. Oh, I should have put the sector in. You're right. I'm sorry. Brain fart. All right, this won't take as long, I promise. You're right. I put the commodity in. I should have put the um, – where's metals and mining? What's the MG symbol on that? All right, this is not going as, as planned. Let me see if I can find it over here real quick. Ugh, every time I hit the wrong key, it dings in my head. Do the voices in my head bother you? All right, let's see. Gold, metals, and mining. MG135. Jeez, what a long hopefully, – hopefully this is not a long run for a short slide. MG135. MG135. It's so funny. I could do this stuff in my sleep, but, boy, I try to do it in a presentation where the charts are popping up. All right, now we did have a point with all this. All right, so this is gold in the background, and this is gold stocks in the background, and this is Goro in the foreground. So the point was that it pulled back more than the sector. I don't know. I mean, this is not the scale, but if you look at the pullback of the gold stocks, that was pretty serious. Based on this pullback here, it doesn't look too bad compared to the, sec to the sector itself on a relative basis. Okay. Sorry about the, that long run for the short slide. But to answer your question on that, I think it's okay. Uh, Jerry, what's new about Elf? Well, 
He's a little fella. Oh, stock elf. Okay. Um, the rule with IPOs is if you're playing the first breakout, ideally you want them to be below $20 a share. So based on that, it's not a setup. But what you could do is put it on your watch list and play the next pullback. So absolutely keep that one on your watch list for sure. CLCD for Arsony on TKO. CLCD, that's going to be something cloud, right? Colucid Biotechnology. Uh, yeah, it's at all-time highs. Uh, it's had quite the run, though, 300%. So, yeah, TKO. Yeah, it would have to be the mother of all TKOs, like a, just an absolute smashing, uh, maybe some sort of news event, something crazy. And then, but yeah, it would have to be, again, the mother of all TKOs. In respect to support, but some of the miners ahead stopped out. Yeah, we had, um, if memory serves, we had a bumpy ride in the miners this year, with the exception of CNX. And that's, that's, that's life. I mean, that's what we're, these are the ones we've been waiting for. You just chip away at it, take some losses here and there, take your lumps. And then you hit it out of the park and you do well. But it's the meantime that separates the men from the boys. Okay, Kent says, oh, thanks. You're welcome, Kent. Anytime, buddy. Maybe, oh, yeah, I'm sorry about that. that GDX, yeah, that would have been a good one to use. Thank you. Sorry about that long. Uh... Okay, uh AMKR looks okay. It's semis, which is a good thing. Um, it's got some action longer term, but it's so far back there. I wouldn't get too excited about that. Uh, it would have to break out of this base more decisively and then look to play a pullback. Put it on your watch list for sure, but uh, I have to wait. Poor AJ left. He got tired of me trying to uh, set that up. <laughs> GRBP. Oh, CRPB. I wish there was a way to. I wonder if there's a way to change a font on this thing. CRBP. Yeah, this one, I think I wanted it to pull. I think it would need a little bit more pullback. I know it sounds kind of crazy, but based on the volatility of the stock, based on the fact that it tripled over a short period of time, it would really have to have a pretty serious knockout move for me to go after it. Okay. HZN, did we look at that one? That's Horizon. Um, yeah, did we talk about this one? Maybe a continued breakout and then a pullback? Absolutely. Uh, but see, it's just coming out of the base. We probably talked about it last week, too. EXEL for Mr. Jim. Hey, Jim. Yeah, this is – I'm so glad you brought this one up because this is the mother of all TKOs, even though it came off of – it made a new high on the same day. This was a type of TKO move. If, if um, It doesn't quite fit a TKO because of the way it, it gapped higher first. But on that one we talked about earlier, I forget the name of it, that crazy biotech, you'd want to see a TKO that looks something like this, just like a, a spanking, something that could have really shook the trees – Suck at some shorts, spit out some longs, or knock out some longs, and then an entry above the high of that move. And if it doesn't trigger, then, hey, you missed a losing trade. That's a good thing. And if it does, you might have the mother of all winners. So when you have the mother of all TKOs like this, if it triggers, you might have the mother of all winners, but then you can miss a lot of losers. You're mentioning percentages earlier regarding service. As of today, I'm showing 68.87% winner so far this year. Yeah, that's a huge number, Craig. Um, that's really big, and I've been working hard to make that happen. But I don't, I don't focus too much on percent correct. But uh, roughly 70% correct. I'm not, I'm not always that good. Knock on wood, especially given a, a sideways choppy market. But obviously, I'm going to keep striving to be that good. I must strive for 100%, okay, and just let the chips fall where they may. But I appreciate you uh, you mentioning that. Thank you so much. 
But I'd rather be less accurate and make more money. And that's one of the perverse things about this business is I'd actually rather be more wrong but make more money, if that makes any sense. Well, obviously, I want to be right 100% of the time. I don't want to make money 100% of the time. But it's a few big winners that make a year. So I'd like more big winners at the sacrifice of uh, being a little less accurate. But, yeah, that's 68%. Usually people ask me, you know, what's your, where's your percent correct at all, which I think is irrelevant, okay? But, obviously, people look at these things. If I'm hitting – in the 60s to 70s, I'm not saying I'm not going to cover off the ball, but I'm I'm doing fairly well. I'm doing really well, okay? Now, again, it your percent correct is important. It's whether you're making money or not. But as a general statement, they, they are a little correlated. So the more accurate you are, obviously, the better you're doing. But, yeah, if I'm hitting close to 70%, I'm doing really well, okay? So – and that means that I'm still wrong 30% of the time, at least. So don't focus on the percent correct too much, though. Your mileage may vary. <laughs> Would 13 be an entry on EXEL? EXEL. Uh, I would give it more wiggle room than that. Um, I mean, this this TKO, and see, this is where, do I bend the rules or not? I saw this one yesterday. And if this... I would have, would have preferred if this this uh, this open was below this high in here, but yeah, if you're trading it as a pullback, 13 is just way too close for this one. Okay, uh, but yeah, that's kind of like the mother of that's kind of a crazy one. But when a stock goes parabolic like this, you almost want a crazy move like this to shake everybody out. TWLO, that's an IPO. Uh, yeah, so far so good as far as that last little pullback here. Um, the only problem is you're just kind of barely clearing the prior high in here. So this would have to really clear that prior high. This is on my watch list, obviously. But it would really have to clear this prior peak in here decisively and then pull back again. LN for Frenchie. Hey, Frenchie, hadn't seen you in a while. How you been? Uh... Maybe. Now, it needs a little bit more pullback. Now, usually I don't like them when they pull back below their prior highs, but it's still a relatively new issue. So that's where I kind of bend the rules a little bit. Bend the rules going in, not once in. Hey, write that down. Bend the rules going in if you must, but not once in. So maybe if it pulls back, I might be willing to go with this one. But I'll know it when I see it. Definitely put it on your watch list. Seems like you're probably thinking this guy hates everything. Well, no, the market's been a little choppy lately. So what we're doing now is we're kind of in get ready to get ready mode. We're building that watch list. Okay. And when the time comes, we're going to execute. By the way, if you're on the service, if you hover, I, I don't, I'm not going to publish this every week or every day or every month, but occasionally I will put it up there for you. Uh, especially when I'm talking about it a lot. Uh, my watch list, if you hover over name, uh, and this doesn't work in a delayed service, by the way. There's a lot of things that aren't in a delayed service just because it would be a nightmare to implement them. And the other thing is I want to give my uh, paid clients uh, a little something extra, a little lanyap, as we say in Louisiana. But in the paid service, you get the live commentary. You get the frequently asked questions. You get all those things in there. Uh, and questions about existing positions and potential positions. And also, if you hover over your name, there's my files. Go in there, and you can pick up the momentum list, which I published a couple of days ago. So you'll see that momentum list I keep talking about. But this is just so this would go in the momentum list if it's not already there. But, yeah, now is the time to, to publish, to uh, create your list, not necessarily take a whole lot of action. ARG for John, A-I-R-G. This is one that I've been watching a lot, too, and it's in my list also. Um, on a pullback, absolutely. Good eye, John. A-R-E-X. Somebody a while back said, you never like any stocks I picked. Uh, you're so mean to me. It's like, oh, not being mean. It's just <laughs> it's it's it, the stock has nothing to do with you. It's just it is what it is, and the market's been choppy. Uh, I don't like the way this would pull back below its prior breakout in here. 
So this would have to break out to new highs and then pull back again. Hopefully, whoever just asked, that's not that person. Uh, only problem is, as you can see from weekly charts prior, notice it has a lot of overhead supply. So by the time it made new highs and everything and then pulled back, you would be dealing with this overhead supply issue. Uh, Beeson, we already talked about, I think. Uh, let me know if I didn't cover it. Cover it. I think I did. Uh, Novin, N-O-V-N. And remember, these can be recorded. I don't want to bore everybody to death and go over the same ones over and over. Too late? You already bored? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, this looks pretty good on a pullback, absolutely. Okay. Um, this was one we were talking, I was talking about a client a couple days ago. It doesn't quite fit the rule for the buy at B strategy because it's above $20 a share. So what I would do in a case like this is I'd wait for the pullback. But absolutely, this one's on my list. Little on the thin side uh, with IPOs, not enough time to get into it today, but you have to really look at the volume and just make sure you have at least some decent volume in here. Okay, uh, AMKR, we're in lightning round now. Let's see. We, okay, yeah, we covered that one. Uh, Lee. Yeah, this this needs to be, again, you know, I feel like I'm beating the dead horse. This is, needs to be on your momentum list. It's not set up at this moment. Has a little overhead supply way back here. That's probably okay. It's pretty far back. Fairly thin given the price of the stock. So a few caveats in here. Uh, it needs a little more pullback, but if it pulled back a little more, then it'd be below this peak. So I'd have to reevaluate it then. Probably the best course of action would be let it break out the new highs and then look to play the next pullback. The good news is we're getting a lot of stocks setting up on the momentum list, NPT, and I think this was going to be another one. Yeah, this one looks pretty good. It needs a tiny bit more pullback for me to be happy with it. Maybe let it take out 16 a little bit, but it does look good. Uh, who, whoever brought that up, good job. Grub for Frenchie. Did we look at that one, Frenchie? Had a neighbor named Frenchie. Um, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. No, yet another one put on your momentum list. Although I would like to see a little acceleration. Notice it kind of went straight up in here and then it kind of drifted higher. Um, so I like to see some acceleration higher and then look to play pullbacks along the way. <laughs> well, he was named Frenchy because he was a uh, Cajun like me, but he was really Frenchy Cajun. Or as we say uh, down here, coon ass. I'm a coon ass, so I could call people coon ass. Uh, it's actually an endearing term. Uh, this one I have to pull back a little bit, but definitely good. Tr you know, again, all you guys are bringing up. This is probably the best stock picking I've ever seen, even though not a whole lot of stocks have been set up because you're you're ferreting out the stocks that are in great trend. So you're doing a great job. Okay, a couple of more, and then we're going to have to shut it down. Uh, easy, PW. I'd stay here all day, but this, it gets a little hard to track. Yeah, this is one where you're going to have to wait for continued breakout and then look to play your first pullback. Remember, we're not breakout players. We're pullback players. My only concern here is that you're fighting the sector. But sure, the stock looks like it's in a great trend, and it might be worthwhile in pullback. So yet another stock to put in your momentum list. So um, I don't know if I'm due next show or not, but over the next couple of weeks, we should have some really good setups out of these stocks. So you guys have done a great job with this. Uh, I need to go ahead and shut things down based on uh, time schedules and recording. So uh, any unanswered questions, you can shoot me an email, Dave at Dave, Landry com. Everyone have a fantastic week. Again, next show's week, next week's show. I'm not sure if we'll do it or not. Uh, but if I do, hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls there too. If not, I'll hope to see you the following week. Uh, thanks so much. I appreciate you guys showing up. I'm humbled by you guys being here and girls. So thanks again, and then uh, hopefully we'll see you within either next week or week after. Thank you so much.